I'm going to uh, talk about Paris and beyond. Um, before we look at uh, the beyond bit, it's always good to have a look at the history and some of the background. Uh, I'll also make some uh, observations about the uh, Paris uh, Agreement and Paris negotiations, uh, and then look at specifically the outcomes and the announcements. Announcements, announcements, announcements. There were so many at uh, Paris, um, but it's worth paying attention to what some of those were. And then we'll briefly touch on what some of this means for business and, and what next. So, the background. Um, Paris hasn't happened in isolation. Paris was known as COP2021, 20, which is the Conference of the Parties, the UNFCCC. This is a sector filled with acronyms. Um, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework <coughs> Convention on uh, Climate Change. The, the 21 means that it's the 21st meeting. It's been going on for 21 years. And now we have this Paris Agreement. But of course, we've had the Kyoto Protocol, the Marrakesh Accords, Cancun Agreements, Warsaw this, Lima that, and so on. So this is a process that has been going on for many years, involving a huge number of countries and, uh, uh, um, and parties participating. Um, it was very much in danger of being a moribund process uh, before Paris, in my view. Um, Copenhagen was a notable failure, not a complete failure, but a very disappointing outcome back in 2010. Uh, but Paris, in my view, has re-energized this process and, and set an important direction of travel for the future. So, uh, why was Paris important? Well, we saw a coming together of a huge number of heads of state, more than had ever come together before in history. About 150 heads of government, heads of state came together uh, in Paris. And also, there was an enormous uh, meeting in the business community, and particularly the investor community. Uh, there were a number of investor-focused uh, uh, initiatives that came out. Um, and that engagement with the financial and investment community is critical. And I think one of the successes for Paris was both the pre- and post-engagement and translation of uh, climate policy into the finance community. Um, the finance community is enormously uh, important in this. If we are going to make these changes, we have to find a way to pay for them and finance them. So that engagement is I extremely important. And furthermore, there was an unprecedented engagement with the press and translating that climate policy into you know, normal people speak that we can actually understand and, and know what it means to us. Um, I have to commend the uh, French government uh, for their leadership and that of the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon. There was a huge amount of uh, effort to uh, uh, bring uh, a successful agreement to Paris. They, they readdressed the way that uh, the negotiations uh, took place. The heads of state came in at the beginning rather than at the end, which was something uh, that happened at Copenhagen, which was a complete disaster. Uh, their attention to detail was amazing, right down to the fact that the lighting in the negotiating rooms was specifically designed to create a low-stress environment and um, things like that. You know, that, that uh, you have to commend the French in this instance, much begrudgingly, of course. Um, and then, of course, the announcements, announcements, announcements. The international negotiations and policy dialogue uh, that happens under the UNFCCC is hugely important, but it's also become a rallying point uh, and uh, coalescing of uh, other initiatives uh, and, and a catalyst for other initiatives. And a lot of announcements were, were made there, and I'll, I'll look at some of those in, in a minute. The other thing that was interesting at Paris, we saw the emergence of new coalitions. Now, getting international agri political agreements, or any agreement really, does require coalition building. And two new coalitions emerged, uh, the Vulnerable Countries Grouping, which uh, uh, drove the more ambitious outcomes, and this High Ambition Coalition, which you know, included some surprising parties, the US the, uh, uh, and Australia, which have historically uh, 
been the most uh, successful winners of the Climate Dinosaur Awards at the UNF uh, C negotiations. So it was good to see these new coalitions emerging and creating um, uh, momentum for agreement. And of course, the structure of the agreement was important, this, particularly for the US. Uh, we had to bear in mind that uh, we knew long before the agreements that you know, Congress has just sort of ground to a halt in doing anything so constructive. So the agreement was specifically designed to allow it to be implemented in the US by executive order uh, by President Obama, avoiding the congressional uh, process. So that's quite important. And we saw that the actual Paris Agreement is an appendix to the decision by the Conference of the Parties. So there are all these important um, things that, are, that are, have been implemented to make, this, to make Paris a success. Of course, because Paris is a success, uh, it doesn't mean there's going to be a successful outcome. There is going to be a lot of ongoing work to make sure that that one single success continues and is implemented. And I think it's much more a question of what, it's stopped being a question of what will governments do, it's, it's what they won't do is now going to be important. So what were the outcomes? Well, it was uh, important to uh, note that we actually moved beyond a reference just to a two degree warming target, uh, to, a, to an ambition of one and a half degrees warming. Uh, that was driven by the Vulnerable Countries Coalition because uh, we know that two degrees is still not going to be sufficient. And of course, when we talk about two degrees or one and a half degrees, actually that in itself is not a certainty. Two degrees, it means there's a 50% chance of limiting warming to two degrees. So actually, you know, there's a 50% chance that we won't do it, even if we do implement it. Um, and importantly, the, the Paris Agreement does maintain the original uh, context and the original sort of framework commitments um, that go right back to 1992, where we had uh, transfer of finance and technology from the developed world to the developing economies. That has been maintained in the Paris Agreements. Um, but importantly, what has been added to them is uh, uh, as part of the reciprocity for maintaining those uh, obligations is commitments from the developing world. And that's uh, uh, hugely important. That was one of the things that uh, uh, really stopped uh, Kyoto being ratified by the US, the lack of commitments from the developing world. You know, uh, and economies in trans transition. Some of those economies are, of course, the large, some among the largest emitters out there. So they need to be part of that process. They are now that. Um, we have um, uh, uh, this is an iterative process. So we have commitments for every five years to go back and revisit. Have we implemented the things that we said we're going to be doing? That's why I said, you know, it's about what governments and countries don't do is going to be important. We've got new rules for uh, uh, international carbon markets, uh, the opportunity to create new acronyms such as ITMOs. We had the CDM and the JI and all these great things. I'm not sure ITMO will actually take off because normally there are only three letters and ITMO is four, so uh, that might have to be changed. But that's incorporated under Article 6 uh, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, we saw that, personally, I saw that as a, a great win. Markets are an important part of the, creating the economics and capturing some of the value that, that I think it's Ben mentioned that is not captured in, in uh, the normal transactional uh, course of, and measurements of GDP. So we are finding ways to recreate the economy here. Um, we have new mechanisms to go beyond the offsetting, which was uh, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, the CDM and JI parts. Um, uh, one notable miss, however, I, in my view, was the source of demand for those offsets. We still don't have clear demand. It's fine if you, you, know, if you want to create a market, you have to have supply, but you also have to have demand. So that, uh, that still needs some, some working on. 
We even saw the aviation and uh, shipping sectors brought into, into the agreement. They got a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card uh, under Kyoto and was sort of, uh, because it was deemed too complex at the time, how do you uh, um, manage shipping and aviation? Are you char charging or putting the liability on the, 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 the flag of the ship country or by the cargo owner or where it starts from, where it goes to? All those things were sort of uh, handed down to their respective industry organizations to come up with a solution. They singularly failed to do that, um, and it was rather embarrassing for both the shipping and aviation industries not to have done anything. And indeed, when Europe sought to take unilateral uh, action against the aviation industry, um, it created a, a somewhat of an international uh, furor. Uh, furor, rather than furor. Um, <laughs> and uh, we saw that uh, you know China started and India started threatening to say no, well, European airlines can't come to uh, 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 China and India, and the same in the U.S. Um, now they are uh, maintained within that Paris Agreement, which is great. Uh, we have additional things like uh, uh, we maintain the sh uh, common but differentiated responsibilities but we've added a new aspect of that into, in light of different national uh, circumstances, uh, another great acronym there, I shan't even try to pronounce that. And then we also have this loss and damage aspect, which was maintained from the Warsaw uh, Convention, which was referenced earlier. But importantly, there was, there was a specific exclusion in the Paris Agreement to any liability and any compensation. Uh, that's a very sensitive uh, subject, particularly for the developing countries. So that, that, that was, uh, that's the sort of high-level outcomes. So I mentioned announcements. Uh, there are announcements galore. I'll just touch on a couple. I won't, uh, I'm sure I didn't capture all of them. But just in the uh, clean energy announcements, it's really important to see how much uh, emphasis is going to be put onto energy R&D. Uh, interestingly enough, I was talking to a, uh, a leading um, early stage uh, tech investor uh, about what this might mean, and I thought, okay, well, there's a lot of investment in uh, energy R&D. Well, actually, from the private sector, most of it has been a very poor performing sector for uh, early stage energy R&D. So we now have this breakthrough energy coalition with some of the uh, 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 big names in tech, uh, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezio, uh, and a bunch of other billionaires have come together to uh, um, drive that. That does have a link with the Mission Innovation and uh, Climate Investor One. Um, and Mission Innovation is about doubling country R&D into clean energy technologies. We have Geothermal Action Alliances, Nitric Acid Climate Alliances, Africa Renewable Energy Initiative, all really good stuff. Then we have action being taken at the city and region level. This has been important because when we saw uh, Copenhagen being a failure, actually there's been huge initiatives and action taken by cities and regions. You have programs like the C40 um, and the Mayor's Initiative. Um, uh, which, has been, which has been great. And then finance initiatives, we've got, uh, I think, Julie, you mentioned uh, Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg uh, are driving uh, action under the Financial Stability Board. We've got divestment, um, uh, people driving uh, invest, uh, divestment of fossil fuel assets. Huge numbers of um, uh, institutional investors have been signing up to these things. And then, uh, of course, uh, we go everywhere with uh, some multilaterals in tow, um, and uh, uh, such as the, the Green Investment Bank. We now have uh, the Global Green Investment Bank Network, which is fantastic. Uh, and then infrastructure, which is sometimes overlooked in the, in the, the green economy, but building resilient and uh, low-carbon infrastructure is uh, similarly uh, valuable. So uh, what does this mean for business? Well, there's a few quotes up there, but effectively this sets it 
very clear direction of tra travel for a change in the economy. It is going to continue to impact agriculture, infrastructure, transport. Um, you know, there's going to be new te technological innovations in renewable energy. We're going to see the cost of those uh, te technologies come down. The levelized cost of uh, uh, solar has fallen enormously over, over the years and, and uh, over the last few years. And that is what has been uh, driving the, uh, it, you know, the profitable investments that we are allowing to come off the subsidies such as feed-in tariffs and, then, and these technologies stand on their own two feet and compete against coal and fossil fuels. Uh, <clears throat> then, you know, so there, there's, there's opportunities across the, uh, across the spectrum. Even, you know, construction industry, that accounts for a third of emissions, uh, housing and, and uh, uh, buildings. So in that industry, it's going to have an impact. Does this mean it's the end of the fossil fuel era? Well, no, of course it uh, doesn't. You know, fossil fuels, there's always going to be a role, or for a long time there's going to be a role for uh, fossil fuels going forward. They're very good at what they do. Um, but I like this quote from Michael Liebreich at the Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, equating the, um, the relationship that the, fossil, that the economy and the world has with fossil fuels as a, a sort of abusive uh, relationship and divorce papers have finally been served on that industry um, and that's great and you know it is going to create some winners and losers there is the threat of stranded assets um, there is the threat of um, more shareholder activism it's not just uh, what the SEC says as you know Julie pointed out but actually shareholders want to see these disclosures um, they want, you know, the, the uh, proxy organizations are, are, are getting more involved. You have NGOs like the Asset Owner Disclosure Project, the Carbon Disclosure Project. There is going to be increasingly more and more of this. And, and, and uh, transparency is, uh, is going to be uh, valuable. So what now? Well, this is part of an ongoing process. That was COP21. We've got COP22. We're going to have rules and modalities for the future carbon markets coming out of that. We've got these five yearly stock taking things. Governments have now got to put in place. Uh, they've got to ratify uh, the Paris Agreement, which has this 55 countries and 55% uh, percent of global emissions. Uh, and there's going to be more action at the super and subnational level. And just to finish with one quote, you know, if you don't believe this is going to drive the global economy into a, <clears throat> a new form of economy, uh, I like the um, quote that, uh, the Chinese quote that says, you know, when the wise man points at the moon, only the fool looks at the finger. So we know where we're going. <laughs>